Emmanuel. Lovely to see you here with us. We are here to worship the living God, uh, the eternal God. Uh, this morning is it's an all-age meeting, uh, so there's no children's groups. Um, there's no uh, specific provision for uh, the very little ones. Um, you're welcome to keep them in at any time if you want to. And if you do feel they need some time out, there are some books and toys out in the lobby that you're free to use, but please do feel welcome to keep them with you uh, throughout the whole meeting. Um, in the Bible passage that we're going to be looking at today, we learn that God is reminding Abraham of his promise to him. He says this, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. Do you know what? When someone makes a promise to you, it really matters who it is that person is. Who it is who's making you that promise. And our first song reminds us that the one who makes promises to Abraham and to us is the one we call the Ancient of Days, the Eternal God promises an eternal kingdom. And he can do it because he is eternal. So we're going to start by singing blessing and honour, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. Let's stand and sing this together. <laughs>
today standing. The next song we're going to sing uh, repeats the word promise again and again. I will stand on every promise of your word. When we read through the Bible passage this morning, you'll see that again and again the word covenant is repeated. And a covenant is a type of promise. God is reminding Abraham of his promise to him. And he's saying to Abraham, because of my promise, you should live like this. And this song uh, helps us to think in that way. Because of God's promise, we will live in this way. Your covenant is sure, and on this I am secure. I can stand on every promise of your word. Consider my sighing. 
Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my requests before you and wait in expectation. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With the wicked, with you the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men, the Lord abhors. But I, by your great mercy, will come into your house. In reverence will I bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness, because of my enemies. Make straight your way before me. Lord God, we thank you that you are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. We thank you that you are a good God. Thank you that everything you choose to do is good. Thank you that this world you have made is good. Thank you that you pour into our lives so many good things. Father, we know that this is a world that is full of evil because of the sinful choices of human beings. And Lord, your word has just told us that wicked people cannot dwell with you. Arrogant people cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. And Lord God, we want to acknowledge that that describes every person in this world in their natural state. Every single one of us but Lord God, we want to thank you this morning that we can approach you not simply as a good God, but as a merciful God. Thank you that the promise of your word is that by your great mercy, we will come into your house. And Lord, we want to, in reverence in our hearts, bow down to you and worship you. We want to give you thanks, Lord God, that you cleanse our sin, that you forgive our wrongdoing. And Lord, we are completely dependent on your mercy, on the blood of the Lord Jesus that paid the price for our sin so that we could be welcomed in your holy temple. Lord God, we thank you that today we meet to worship and hear from a good God. Amen. Amen. So please turn in your Bibles to page 17 in the Blue Bibles, that's Genesis chapter 17. I'm afraid this is the final week where the chapter corresponds with the page number. So you'll have to have your wits about you from next week. So chapter 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. 
Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of twelve rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household, all bought with his money, every male in his household, and circumcised them, as God told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised, and his son Ishmael was 13. Abraham and his son Ishmael were both circumcised on that same day, and every male in Abraham's household, including those born in his household, all bought from a foreigner, was circumcised with him. Turn it on is the lesson. There we are. I thought this morning that this might work. Yeah. It does work, brilliant. So I would dress in red, white, and blue. So I have my red shirt, my white buttons, and my blue jacket. Maybe you've um, seen some of these around. Flags. Red, white, and blue because. Do you know why we. Anyone know why we're seeing these? Yes, Benjamin? The Queen's Jubilee. Right, yeah. Platinum Jubilee. She's been Queen for 70 years. 70. Let's just think about that for a moment. Do you know anyone who's done anything for 70 years? Do you know anyone who's done anything for 70 seconds? My goodness, that's 70 years of doing the same job. Now, I have to say that I doubt that you'll find anyone else, or hardly anyone else, who's done the same thing for 70 years. It's not very usual nowadays for people to stay in the same job, or to stay in the same relationship, or to stay in the same church or to stay in the same anything for 70 days or 70 weeks or 70 years wow you know they had a special thanksgiving service for the queen i'm not quite sure who they were thanking um but let's say they were thanking god where they might have been but they were at one point the man who was speaking thanked the queen and he said this thank you queen for staying 
the course. If you didn't know already, the Queen loves horse racing and horses. And I think he was, meant, he was trying to be a bit funny about how the Queen was a bit like a horse who stayed the course, as in ran right till the end, didn't fall down at the hurdle, didn't you know, stop at the side for a little graze of grass, uh, didn't kind of like break a leg on the way. Staying the course. Thank you, Queen, for staying the course. You know, it's very, very unusual, and she is a great example, isn't she, of what we might call, or what the Bible calls, faithfulness. Now, faithfulness... Oh dear, I haven't... <laughs> I forgot to stick this together. Um, I've got some blue tags somewhere. Hold on, I'll do it while I'm talking. Faithfulness is what the Bible says. Where is my blue tag? Here it is. No, it's not. There it is. White tag, in fact. Faithfulness is what the Bible's word for is, is for staying the course. Someone who stays on the same track day after day, week after week month after month, year after year, dependable, does everything they say they're going to do, never deviates. That is someone, not only who stays the course, but someone who displays faithfulness. There we are. Faithfulness. Okay, that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. Faithfulness. It's very, very rare. And yet God loves it, and God looks for it. So we're going to pop that up on here. There and there. I saw them do this on Blue Peter when I was younger. They did it so much better. There we are. Faithfulness. We're going to be thinking about that this morning. What is it to be faithful? What does it mean to be faithful. Why should we be faithful? What happens if we're, we're not faithful? Let me do a little recap, because there are some people who haven't been here whilst we've been in Genesis. This is what we've been thinking about in Genesis so far. We've seen that there is a God who wants to bless the whole world, and he did that through creation. But something went wrong. Adam and Eve sinned, and now God is blessing the world, not through creation, but through, we might call new creation, through redemption, through salvation. And we've seen that he called a man called Abraham. Here's a picture of what Abraham may or may not have looked like. There we are, there's Abraham, and God made him some very, very special promises that we have been thinking about. It's called a covenant. We've already thought about that word this morning, a covenant, a promise to Abraham, particularly a promise that he would have a baby boy. Can you remember, can anyone remember why that was quite an unusual promise for Abraham? Anyone apart from my children? <laughs> yes? My goodness. Yes, she was very, very old and she hadn't, she wasn't able to have children. But God said, I'm going to give you a baby boy, but it's going to be not just for you, it's going to bless the whole world. It's for everyone. The promise is to Abraham, but it's for everyone. Now, most of us here this morning are in the world. If you're not, who are you? But it's for us. It's God's promise for us. Now, we've seen throughout Genesis, that God's promise has some very special qualities. Because God's promise is not like our promise. Our promises sometimes, um, well, are not that great. But God's promise, we've seen, cannot be lost. Remember when Abraham went to Egypt and it looked like they were in trouble, but we found that God's promise couldn't be lost because God saved Abraham and Sarah, and we've also seen that God's promise cannot be stolen. Remember when those armies came, and they came to take away, and they took away Lot and his, um, his family, and yet Abraham, through God's power and strength, managed to save Lot. God's promise cannot be stolen either, 
And last week we saw that God's promise cannot be DIY'd. You can't bring about God's promise by yourself. You can't do it yourself. Can you? That's what we saw last time. But we have also been seeing that God's promise comes by faith. That is, by believing that what God has said is true and that what God has said he will do. And that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning, that not only are we to have faith, but faith works its way out in faithfulness. That's the word faith. So to be faithful is to have faith and to act in line with that faith. And we're going to think about this morning, what does it mean to be faithful? And there are two things, or three things actually, we're going to think about this morning. Uh, let me introduce you to the first one of these. Mm. Which one should I take down? I think I'll take these down. You have to remember these, all right? Stolen. Can't do it itself. Can't be lost. We need to have faith. And the first thing we're going to think about this morning is that faithfulness is what God wants. Faithfulness is what God wants from us. And it looks really like this. it begins here. This is where faithfulness begins. You want to be faithful to what God wants. It begins with worship. It begins right here with worship. Stay. Good. Now look at verse 1. If you've got your Bible open, that would be really handy. Um, you can see where we're going. Verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. And Abraham fell face down. You know, since last week, there have been 13 years, 13 more years of waiting for Abraham. Some of you haven't even been alive for 13 years. They haven't. Uh, some of you haven't even been alive for 13 years, but 13 years is a long time to wait. But Abraham and Sarah say, seem to have learnt their lesson that God's promise cannot be DIY'd. As far as we know, they didn't try and DIY God's promise again in their lives. But 13 years have gone by, and they've waited patiently. And what it means to worship who God is. Who is God? That's where worship begins, by seeing who God is. Who is God? How did God introduce himself in the passage? Can anyone tell me? Do you know Benjamin? Do you remember what God said? And he said, hello Abraham, my name's God Almighty. El Shaddai, God Almighty. Something like that, anyway. Now here's what we need to understand. The worship is where faithfulness begins. And worship begins with seeing who God is. Now, how I introduce myself to you um, changes how you relate to me. So I go into um, uh, the primary school where our kids go, and Mr. Joy, the headmaster, said to me, how do you want me to introduce you? Now, how do you, I don't know, sir? Oh, that would be good, wouldn't it? King? Um, Mr. Taylor Weeks? Adrian or AD. Now they all have a slightly different feel, don't they? I'm AD to the kids there, eventually. Um, they all call me that, that. And it's because, you know, that's the kind of, I'm not a teacher. They don't have to kind of like listen to me most of the day. They just have to enjoy listening to me every now and again on a Monday. In our household, one of my children has started to think it's a good idea to call me AD. <laughs> now, I'm not going to tell you who he or she is, um, 
But I, <laughs> I'm not, I don't allow them to call me AD. I don't know, maybe that's just like being old fashioned. It's not because I'm not friendly. I'm actually quite friendly sometimes at home. But it's because how, what they, how they address me, what they call me, shapes how we relate, doesn't it? So if I let him call me AD, you know, he's going to say, oh, hi, right, AD, yeah, go to the school. I'm like, that's fine. But I like him to say, oh, daddy, you know, as in like that. So it defines the relationship, doesn't it? So how you call me, what you call me, changes how we relate. And I think it's really, really important that we see this morning that God is God Almighty, El Shaddai. God Almighty. And did you see what effect it had on Abraham? What did Abraham do when God said, Hi Abraham, my name's El Shaddai. It's there, I think, in verse 1. What did Abraham do when he saw El Shaddai? God Almighty. What effect did it have on Abraham? <coughs> do you know, Johnny? Not sure? You had your hand in the air. Oh, Benjamin, you've got your hand up again. All right, go on then. He did give him a new name, didn't he? What, and what did Abraham do when God said, my name's Almighty? He yeah. fell He fell fat, flat on his face, didn't he? He fell on his face. Did you see that in verse 1? He fell face down. Now, the, El, the word, here's a little quiz for some grown-ups. The word El Shaddai... We well, can ask, and we can all join in this. It's not really a quiz. It's just a little, little interesting fact. The word El Shai, God Almighty, appears in one book in the Bible more than any other book, apparently. I've not counted, but this is what I've read. So you can check it out later. What book do you think that is? What book do you think? Anyone want to guess? It doesn't matter if you don't want to. It's fine. Do you want to guess something? Revelation. Not quite Revelation. Sure. Yes, Josiah. Matthew. Joseph? Genesis. Genesis, not actually Genesis. It doesn't happen very often. Genesis of oh, Johnny, do you know? Psalms. Oh, yeah, well, a lot of times in Psalms. So I tell you that the, 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 the book is the book of Job. The book of Job. Now that's really interesting because in the book of Job, God Almighty, you remember what happens in the book of Job? Job is. A suffering, and he's trying to wrestle with who God is. His friends think they know who God is. They're wrestling with what's right and wrong. God is almighty, the judge who can bless and can curse, and who can sort out their enemies. No one can stand against God almighty. No one can stand against God almighty. Here's what one of Job's friends says to Job. Listen to this. Can a man be of benefit to God? Can even a wise person benefit him? What pleasure would it give the Almighty, Shaddai, if you, Job, were righteous? What would he gain? What would God gain if your ways were blameless? Now, I reckon Abraham would have said quite a lot, actually, because Abraham knew that God was very interested in him being blameless. Because secondly, faithfulness, it's not a, I mean, worship, it doesn't just start with who God is. Faithfulness is what God wants. Isn't that amazing? That God would want our, us and our faithfulness. He would want us to be true to our words too, to, to love him and to serve him with all our hearts. Now here's the amazing thing. If God is so almighty and so above us, and so wonderful and so separate from us as he is, why would he take any interest in us? Isn't that an amazing thing that God cares how we live? God cares how we treat each other in the yard out there when we're playing a game of football or inside when we're talking to each other. God cares about all of that. It's not insignificant or meaningless to him. Isn't that an amazing thought? That at home, when you're having a little argument with your uh, mum or dad or your brother or sister or your housemates or whatever it is, God actually cares about how you speak. And God care, cares about how you treat them. God requires faithfulness. He's looking for faithfulness. Now, when people meet the Queen, do you know what they have to do? 
So if you're a man, I think you do a bow, don't you? And you ladies do a curtsy like this, right? And it's a mark of respect, isn't it? Now, Abraham didn't curtsy or give a little bow. He fell on his face. And I want to suggest this morning that that's what we should be doing. Now, I don't mean that we should walk around with our faces on the floor the whole time. But I do mean that that should be the attitude of our hearts. That's where faithfulness begins, in seeing how wonderful God is and bowing down to him in, in our hearts. We should be shaped by the reality of who God is. That God is God and we are not. God is El Shaddai, we are not El Shaddai. But so often we're taught, aren't we, that we are the centre of the universe. Children, you're not the centre of the universe. I'm not the centre of the universe. Imagine how many of our problems on the football pitch or in our homes would be solved if we realised that it wasn't actually all about us. It's not all about you. It's about him. It's about God. It's about him. He is El Shaddai. We are not. Just think how much easier it would be to suffer injustice or if someone doesn't pass the ball to me when they should have done or when someone says an unkind word to me if we realise actually God's in charge. God is almighty. God is the one that the whole universe revolves around. God is not a genie in my pocket that I can rub and decide to get what I would like whenever I'd like it. No, we are here to serve him. He's not here to serve us. We and our lives and our plans are not the centre of the universe. God and his plans are. Faithfulness begins with worship. Worship begins with seeing who God is and falling on our faces and saying, I'm yours. I'm all yours. Sorry? We're going to sing about what it means to live a faithful life. He has showed you, a man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? Now, look, I've got a key ring here. Um, I generally pick up these keys every day. And on this one, this was a kind gift to me. It says, love mercy, seek justice, walk humbly. And that, that reminds me that um, every day I'm to... Try to live faithfully for God like this, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That word humble is a bit like the way he was saying, bowing down in our hearts, recognising that God is great and we are not. This is what it is to live faithfully. So let's sing together.
Hello everyone, we're there getting there. So here we are. We see that faithfulness, okay, to be faithful, we have to start with worship. Okay, so I'll keep that up there. It's what God wants. Worship. Okay, and we worship freely by seeing who God is and falling on our faces. The second thing we're going to see is this. That God's that faithfulness to God actually rests on God's promise to us. Not in the first place on our promise to him. And we are those who should trust God's promises. Now we've seen quite a lot about what God has promised and our need to trust him. So let's have another look at, at that. Have a look. There it says, walk before me faithfully. Oh no, sorry, not there. Um, there we are, back at, say, 3b. So we're going to look at the uh, second part of verse 3, right to the end of verse 22 of this bit, all right? So we're going to see three things uh, today um, in this section. Faithfulness rests on God's promise. We're those who need to trust. You see, if we thought that God's covenant and God's promise all down to us, um, we'd be wrong. See, God begins his speech in verse 3b, and he ends it in verse 22. Look at verse 22. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. And in between, we have this speech that's in kind of three sections. Now, you'll notice, have a look at verse 4. God says, as for me, this is what I'm going to do, you guys. Abraham, sorry. This is what I'm going to do. As for me, verse 9. But you, Abraham, as for you, Abraham... And verse 15, and as for your wife, as for Sarai, your wife, as for me, promise, as for you, command, as for Sarai, well, this is another promise to Sarai. One writer writes this, the command, which is what we'll see in a bit, is given to one who has received the promise. The command is the one who has received the is to the one who has received the promise. The command rests on the promise. And faithfulness rests on God's promises to us. Perhaps, um, yeah, sorry, wrong, wrong bit. Um, I said, yeah, this right. So the covenant, we will see in the first bit, as for me, as for me, we'll see the covenant is confirmed. Okay, so we can put tick there. God reminds Abraham of the things he's told him already, really. Did you notice as we read through that some of the things that God says, I will be with you, um, I will make you very fruitful. Will, he's kind of said it before, hasn't he? God's kind of said all this before, apart from this is so much bigger and so much Better, I'm going to read from 3b. As for me, this is the Lord speaking, this is my covenant with you. You'll be the father of many nations. Not just stars in the sky now, as many as that was, but many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham, which sounds a bit like um, father of many. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you. I will make, uh, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your uh, descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants. The whole land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. It's not just one you know, little family, it's kings, nations. It's not just um, a bit of Canaan, it's the whole land of Canaan. It's not just kind of like for a little bit, it's an everlasting possession, an everlasting covenant. This is so much bigger and so much better, so much so we might think, is this a new promise to Abraham? Is this different? Is, what's God doing? Is he giving him another covenant? Well, I think it's a bit like this. <clears throat> Perhaps this summer, uh, some of you are going on a holiday, 
And maybe your mum and dad said to you, we're going on holiday this summer. And you're like, yay, holiday. And as it gets closer, they say, we're going here. We're going to stay in this place. We're getting this ferry. And you get a bit closer, have a look at the pictures. We're going here. You know, it's, it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. The closer you get, the more is revealed and the more excited you become and amazing. And finally, you're off. And you're there. And let's hope it's as good as you hoped. But that's what's going on here. God gives him a new name just to remind him of his promise. Abraham, sounding a bit like father of many. But along with that new promise, well, it wasn't a new promise, a confirmed tip. Yes, Abraham, I'm really am going to do it, and it's going to look like this, as well as the tick. There's a responsibility. Now, who knows what this kind of thing is? You might have seen it's a bit blurry, probably, if I get back here, maybe it's a bit better. Do you, do you know what it is? Do you know? What is it? It's a picture, isn't it? That's right. It's a picture, and it's a seal. It's called a seal. It's a royal seal. If you see that stamped on something, you know that it's good. It's genuine. It's real. It's gonna. It's. It's kind of maybe it's tasty jam or something. I don't know. The queen seal. Yeah, like that. I love some of that. Maybe she has that with her corgis at breakfast. I don't know. Maybe dog food has that on it. By appointment to Her Majesty the Queen. See, God's promise was not only confirmed. Yes, Abraham. It was sealed, and that's what we're going to think about now. You see, God said to Abraham, you must keep my covenant. This is my covenant, and it's to do with circumcision. And you might know that circumcision has to do with cutting, cutting off flesh. That's as far as we'll go for now. If you want some more explanation about that, ask your mum and dad. But it's all to do with cutting, cutting off. Think of a knife. Okay, cutting off flesh, that's what Abraham had to do for himself and all his baby boy, all his sons at the time, and all the sons who would come after him for ever, everlasting covenant. God gave a condition. He said, if you're going to be in my covenant, you've got to do the cutting off. And look at verse 14. Here's how important that was. If you don't do the cutting off, you are going to be cut off. Get it? If you don't do the cutting off, you yourself will be cut off. You can't be a part of my people unless you make the cut. That's the thing. But we need to understand something about circumcision. The cutting didn't make Abraham part of the covenant. Circumcision wasn't a new thing, you see. There were lots of nations around who did the same thing, even before Israel did, and they weren't part of God's covenant. It's not like the actual cutting did the making of the covenant. Okay, it was a sign. It was a sign. It was a sign that they had become part. It accompanied the promise. It starts with God's promise, and the cutting was a sign. Look at, listen to what Romans 4 says. It says this, Abraham received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, while he was still uncircumcised. So God made a covenant and a promise to Abraham before he'd done the cutting. He was in, but he needed to do that as a sign or a seal. I have here two almost identical jars of irresistible co-op marmalade. <clears throat> they have one, though, very important difference. Shall I demonstrate the difference? Yes. Do you see that? It's going in. That's the... So, which one of these would you like to go and buy from co-op, I wonder? This one here? Or this one here? The clippy one. Which one would you like to buy? That one, why? It is full. How do you know that one's not full? What does that mean, do you know? 
it means a seal has broken. All right, so when you go and buy a jar of anything nowadays from the co-op, they have a seal, which means you can guarantee no one has opened it or tampered with it. If nowadays, if you go into, in my day growing up, I didn't have this, but nowadays, if you have one of these, you know someone's opened it. And lo and behold, someone's already eaten the marmalade. Now, I wouldn't buy that from the co-op, but I know that if I open this, or open this, Oh. Sealed. It's gone. Oh dear, I can't now take it back and we've got to eat it very quickly. Marmalade. Now, here's the point. The seal gives us confidence, doesn't it? It gives us something to trust. We trust it. We trust that nobody has tampered with the marmalade because the seal is intact. But as soon as the seal is gone, well, we have no confidence, do we? Who knows what's gone on with it? And here's the thing. That the seal, the cutting, was a seal to give them confidence. For Abraham and his descendants, it was a sign for them to remind them that they had received God's promise and they could really be confident that they had. Imagine that you were a son of 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 Abraham, you had no idea, you'd never met Abraham, and yet you had this promise, which was just a promise, but actually you could remember because you'd had the cut. Oh yeah, I'm in. I'm in, I've, got, I've had the promise, now we're in. It was a reminder, a sign to each individual Israelite that God had made a promise to them to give them confidence, but it was also a sign that reminded them, I need to be faithful. I need to be faithful. I need to have not a circumcised body, but as the Bible says, a circumcised heart. One that is faithful, set apart to God. One that decides to worship him as I should. One that decides to live for God and to live for him, to love him with all my heart. That's what God wanted. He, didn't, he did want the sign, but he wanted something deeper than the sign. He wanted the reality of lives that were lived for him. Now just finally on this little bit. We've got another answer, haven't we? Finally, for Sarah, the covenant is delivered. Now, Ab God says to Abraham, as for your wife Sarah, you are no longer to call her Sarai. She will get a new name. Her name is Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her. She will be the mother of nations and kings of peoples will come from her. And what does Abraham do this time? He laughs. Well, before he laughs, he falls on his face again, doesn't he? <coughs> God Almighty. <coughs> and then he laughs. <coughs> now we could discuss what that means, but at least it means this. What God is promising is just impossible, isn't it? It's an impossible thing from, by human standards that God is promising. And yet it's not impossible, is it? Because God has said it, and God is faithful, and God will do it. Now I'm going to read you um, something from the New Testament. Okay, so listen to this. This is what I'm going to read. So then, Abraham is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised. That's most people here, perhaps. In order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then, so Abraham is the father of the circumcised, who are not only circumcised, but who also fell at following the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Here's the point. That God, Abraham, is the true father, not just the people who've had the cut on their flesh, but who've had the cut on their heart. That's the Those are the children of Abraham. That can include you and me today. That can include us. So we are those who can receive God's covenant, even though we haven't had the physical cut. God wants the heart cut. Now we might be wondering how that happens, and I, here's, here's how it happens. Listen to these words. In Christ, also you were circumcised, that's people who weren't Jews, probably, with a circumcision made without hands, 
by putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sin, nailing it to the cross. Confusing, but here's what it means. Christ was circumcised. But actually, Christ was circumcised. He was cut off. Christ himself was cut off. Cut off from God. Cut off from God's people when he died on the cross because he bore our sin in our place. Because of Christ's circumcision, his cutting off, we can be sure of not being cut off from God's people. That's what it's saying. Christ was cut off so that we might not need to be, so that we might not be cut off. It is through faith in Christ that we become children of Abraham and children of God. When Christ was treated as a sinner in our place for our sin, he was cut off from God in order that we might become one of his children, a child of Abraham and a child of our Heavenly Father. God is faithful. His promise to us was of a saviour. Look at um, part of the next song we're going to sing. God promised a saviour to rescue us from sin. Jesus is redeemer for all who cling to him. Like Jesus, we'll be faithful if we trust and follow him. Our God is faithful. Let's watch our faithful God.
And the final thing is, faithfulness is obeying God's commands. It's obeying God's commands. And so, you know, it's no surprise, we're to be those who obey, who worship. But it begins here, it begins with worship. It leads to trust and obedience. That's what faithfulness is. Now, I don't know if you noticed how we describe Abraham's faithfulness. At least these three words. Immediate, complete, and effective. We can't explain in a minute. Can you imagine that? Immediate, complete, effective obedience. Wow. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Wouldn't our homes be so harmonious if there was that, coupled with complete love on the part of the parents, of course. But here we go, listen to, see if you can pick out these three ideas from the last few verses. On that, verse 23, on that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household and bought them with his, um, or bought with his money, every male in his household and circumcised them as God told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised and his son Ishmael was 13. Abraham and his son Ishmael were both circumcised on that very day. And every male in Abraham's household, including those in his house, born in his household, all bought from a foreigner, was circumcised with him. Lots of repetition there, wasn't there? Lots of repetition. But it was immediate. It was on that very day. It was complete. All those born in his household, every male, just as God has told him, every male, everyone, all of them, just as God has said. You, can, you get an idea? It's complete, isn't it? And it's immediate. And it's effective because it wasn't, it wasn't Ishmael's obedience, was it, that got him circumcised? It was Abraham's. It wasn't everyone else's baby boys, um, all the other baby boys' obedience that got them circumcised. It was Abraham's. It was effective. It was Abraham's obedience that was effective for all his children. That's a wonderful thing because it teaches us something about the Lord Jesus. How is it that we are in God's covenant? Well, isn't it the same? By Jesus' complete and immediate, I guess meaning there was nothing in between, there was nothing to stop him. He submitted and he obeyed completely, and his obedience is effective for us. See, our being in God's covenant, our being in God's family, relies not on our own obedience, but in the obedience of Christ for us. And therefore, we obey. We are faithful because he already has been. We are faithful because we love the one who is faithful to us. So what does obedience look like? Let me read you some verses. There's plenty of places to go to. Listen to these verses from Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. That's what we've meant to have cut off. That's what the circumcised heart's all about. Cutting off. Cut off these things. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. As God's chosen people, of those who have cut off, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. See, here's the thing. It's either obedience and faithfulness or disobedience and God's wrath. It's either 
trust in the one who has cut off for you, or be cut off from God forever, facing his judgment. Now, there is a way to live that we all need to learn, and it's faithfulness to God. It begins with worship for who God is. It shows itself in trust in God's promise and obedience to all that God has commanded. It's the only way to escape God's wrath and to know his blessing. Let's pray, shall we? Well done. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this chapter that we've seen this morning. We've read and we've studied and we've tried to understand uh, what you have there for us. Father, we thank you so much uh, for giving us uh, this chapter. We thank you, Father, uh, for Abraham, for his faithfulness to you because of your faithfulness to him and your promise to him. Father, we thank you that we see in this chapter a picture of what the Lord Jesus has done for each of us. Father, we thank you that we too can be in your covenant. We too can be in relationship with you and know the promises that you have made, a promise of sins forgiven, a promise of peace, and a promise of eternal, unending happiness with you. Father, we thank you that we can be part of that, not because we have done so brilliantly, but because you are faithful. The Lord Jesus was cut off for our, for, because of our sin, in order that we might come uh, to be free to serve you in him. Lord, we long that you would help us this week to be people who trust in your promise, who worship you for who you are, and who obey you in your strength. Amen. Our next song reminds us um, what comes first in living faithfully. As Amy said, uh, we need to be people who live faithfully. But what comes first? It's not this, is it? It's worship. Worshipping God. That's what comes first. And in our next song, one of the verses... That uh, says this, seek him first, then when forgiven, pardoned, made an heir of heaven, let your life to him be given. Seek this first. Let's stand and sing.
Father, thank you for your faithfulness to Abraham. Thank you for your faithfulness to your people throughout the whole um, of history. Thank you that we read about it in the Bible and we are certain of it. Thank you that we can be certain of your faithfulness to us in our lives, knowing that because you kept promises in the past, that you will keep your promises to us. Thank you that we can trust you, that you have given us every reason trust you and your promises. We thank you for the Lord Jesus and thank you for his faithfulness to working out that plan of salvation. Thank you that his obedience um, was, uh, he didn't hesitate in obeying you. We thank you that the Lord Jesus completely obeyed you. We want to thank you that his life of obedience is, is credited to us. 
so that we can be righteous in standing before you. Father God, we want to thank you for examples of faithfulness. And um, Lord, as uh, Amy mentioned, uh, the Queen and her um, life of faithfulness to this country. Lord, we want to uh, thank you for her and we want to pray for her and her family. Lord, that you would use them to be examples of faithful living, not just faithfulness to duty, but Lord, that uh, they would be examples of faithful living before you. Thank you for the words of, of truth that the Queen has spoken about you uh, on many occasions. And Father, we do want to pray for leaders in our country, uh, whether the royal family or members of parliament or uh, other leaders. Father, we want to pray that you would um, raise up those who are Christians, those who love you, those who uh, live lives of faithfulness before you, uh, knowing that uh, they live lives not just um, in front of the public, but Lord, that most importantly, uh, our lives are lived in front of you. And Father, we do pray for uh, those who are Christian MPs, that you would help them to live lives of faithfulness to you and to be good examples of you, speaking truth and light um, as uh, the MPs seek to lead our country. Father, we pray for the situation in Ukraine. We know that you take no pleasure in evil. Lord, we want to pray for peace and for justice in that land. And Lord, if not in this world, we know that you will achieve it um, at the end of time. Lord, when all uh, wrongs will be put right. Father, we thank you for the work of the gospel in Ukraine. Thank you for the baptismal classes that are going on in the town of Umau. Thank you that many people are hearing about uh, the peace that they can have with the God of the universe. And we pray for the Christians as they continue to share that news of hope in that, uh, that war-torn country. Father, we want to pray for Rupert and Margie, especially this week. Help them to continue to have daily joy in you. Father, help them to live out an example of trust in you. That as we witness it as a family, as church family, uh, Lord, that we would see that example of trust and it would spur us on. Father, we pray you would use Rupert for good in the situations that you bring him to, the people he's sat next to, uh, the people he speaks to. Father, help him to speak truth uh, to others who suffer. Father, we do want to thank you for our church community here. Father, we want to pray that you would continue to help us uh, to live out the gospel in our relating to one another. Remind us daily that we are united in Christ. Help us to bear with one another in love. Help us to live with great patience and understanding of one another. Lord, as we relate to one another, help us to um, live out the forgiveness that we have been given in Christ. So help us to forgive one another. Father, we thank you for reminding us today of your great faithfulness to us. And we just pray that you'd help us to be people uh, who worship, who trust, and who obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> so we're going to close this formal time uh, together by singing, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Uh, the only reliable thing for us to trust uh, in this shaky world is in Christ alone. He is called the cornerstone. That is a solid place for us to stand. So let's stand and sing. My hope is built on nothing less.
Father, help us this week to trust in your faithfulness. To know that you are always faithful, you always do what you say you will do. May we be faithful too. Amen.